Good morning, everybody. Eddie Paul here. Good morning. Joshua Paul there. And Cindy Gale, say good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I hope you heard that. She's about 12 feet that way, sitting in her electric lift chair recliner. So she's with us today, but she's out of sight of the camera. So as always, I've got my Bible. And we welcome you to our Church Without Walls. In 1990, 34 years ago, I became the pastor of a small church in Reedsville, North Carolina, just a few miles north of Greensboro. Uh, that was my first church, and I've been a pastor ever since. So here I am today. What, uh, 34 years later? I was a minister before I became a pastor, so I was first ordained in January of 1982, and surprisingly, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. So we welcome you today to our Church Without Walls. We call it that because we don't have a building for you to come to, but we bring the gospel of Jesus Christ where you are. So take your Bibles. Turn with me, please, today to the book of 2 Samuel. There's a first and a second Samuel. So I'm going to go to the last chapter of 2 Samuel, chapter 24. And I'll probably read the whole chapter. It's not long. And as I have shared before, if you're in a hurry, pause this video and come back when you've got more time. Samuel chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 24, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Get to the right page here. I thought I had it marked. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And as I was studying this, I thought about America. God is sick and tired of the sins of America. And if there's such a word as the lukewarmness of the people who call themselves the church. But it says here, and again, wasn't the first time, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he, the Lord, moved David against them to say, so is it any surprise that Israel had a king that God used him against them? Kind of sounds like history's repeating itself today. But God moved David against them to say, King David said, go number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which was with him, Go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. David, as king, was curious. How many people was he king over? Or how many people was there to serve him? And Joab, who was the captain of the host for King David, said unto the king in verse 3, now, the Lord thy God add unto the people how many soever they be, an hundredfold, a hundred times, and that the eyes of my Lord the King may see it. But why doth my Lord the King delighteth in this thing? Why do you want to know? King David, why do you want to know how many people there are? in your kingdom. Verse 4, notwithstanding, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the host, plural. In other words, all those in leadership of the military didn't agree with the king. And you know and I know today, we don't agree with our king either. And Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. 
He was one in authority and they served the authority. Therefore, they went out and did what he said. And unfortunately today, you and me have a government that's doing the same thing. I believe they know what they're doing is wrong. But they're doing it anyway. Because somebody else is in authority. Driving them to do it. And... Verse 5, and they passed over Jordan and pitched in Aror on the right side of the city that lieth in the midst of the river of Gad and toward Jazer. Then they came to Gilead and to the land of Tadam Hashi, and they came to Dajan and about to Zidon. Cities I wouldn't want to name that today. And came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites, of the Canaanites, and they went out to the south of Judah, even to Beersheba. Now listen at this in verse 8. Remember, they didn't have electronics. They didn't have computers. They didn't have calculators. King David sent his men out to number the people in verse 8. So when they had gone through all the land... They came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. All these men, obeying their king, took nine months and 20 days, or nearly 300 days it took them to number the people. And Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people unto the king in verse 9. And there were, listen, and there were in Israel, we're talking about way back then, when Joab counted the people, there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword. Wow. 800,000 men capable of fighting. Now note, they were not counting the women, the children, the old men, or young boys. They were counting the soldiers, those able, willing to fight. And in Israel, there was 800,000, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. Wow, that would be some army today. Can you imagine that under King David's authority, he had 1,300,000 valiant. In other words, none of them were cowards. None of them were uh, objectors. What was that they used to call uh, military objectors? Conscience. Yeah, conscientious objectors. They were valiant men that wanted to fight. 1,300,000. But look at verse 10. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 10. And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, listen, King David, a man after God's own heart, David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have what I have done. And now David recognized his sin. You might ask me, Brother Eddie Paul, what was David's sin? David's sin was that he was putting confidence in the number of soldiers and not in God. So let me ask you today, are you more confident in what God can do for you? Or do you think yourself confident in what you're able to do for God? My Bible says we can do nothing without him. Yet the Bible does say, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. So again, I'm going to ask you today, are you more confident in what God can do for you? Or are you confident of what you think 
you can do for God. So David cried out, I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. Read your Bible. David confessed his sin. He numbered the people. But God moved on David to number the people because God was angry with Israel. Do you think our leaders will ever wake up and realize their sins? Do you think the leaders of America today will wake up and repent of their sins and iniquities? I don't think so. Because the Bible says the blind shall lead the blind and they shall both fall into a ditch. Meaning those who approve of what our government is doing will suffer the consequences with them when God's judgment falls on America. And it is already falling. Look who we have as our leaders. I read long ago that when God is angry with a nation, he gives them evil leaders. And we have a handful of them. Because the Bible says God raises up men to be king and God brings men down. He does not want to be king. Better men than we have have been denied access to office. But now we have men and women who are serving in office who are evil and are destructive to the American way of life. So in verse 11, for when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, remember Old Testament, God told Gad to go and say unto David in verse 12, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. In other words, all right, David, you sinned, you admitted it, you have repented. Now, the Bible carefully says in Galatians, and a lot of church people don't want to receive this, but the Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Did your mama ever tell you, be careful because you're going to reap what you sow? That's where that came from. It's the Bible in the book of Galatians, I think, chapter 6, 5 or 6. You're going to reap what you sow. America is doomed to reap what America has sown all over the world. We have fought in nations we had no business being there. We have taken the spoils of other countries when we ourselves were already rich. America denies the veterans and then they pour out money on those who don't even belong here. You know, and I know very clearly, our government is all messed up. I love my country called America, but I despise those in charge. I'm not going to get off on a political gamut today, but I could. But David was in the same boat, but he confessed to the Lord, and here is what he had choice to reap. But I'm going to tell you something in a minute. America, you ain't got no choice. You don't have a choice, America. God's already said what you're going to suffer, and you don't have a choice. David did. Now let's listen. So God tells Gad to go tell David, thus saith the Lord in verse 12, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them that I may do it unto thee. God said, David, you're going to reap what you sowed. Israel's going to reap. That's why we did what we did. It's time for Israel to suffer under its sins 
iniquities. So David, I'm going to give you a choice. I, I remember many years ago when parents would give their kids a choice to uh, give up something, take a spanking, or go to bed early without dinner, whatever. You had a choice. My daddy didn't give me no choice. My daddy would yank his belt out of his pants, double it, and just whoop me till he was tired. I didn't get a choice because that would not have been what I would have chosen. So Gad, in verse 13, came to David and told him and said unto him, Listen, here's his choices. You might want to make note of that. Gad said, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land, David? Choice number one, do you want God to strike the land of Israel with a famine for seven years? I thought of that. God struck Egypt with a famine for seven years after they had seven years of plenty. Or, Gad said, wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? David, do you want an army greater than yours to chase you and your army for three months? And you know if they chased them, they'd kill a bunch of them. Finally, or third choice, that there be three days pestilence in thy land. Where have we heard the word pestilence? COVID. And it's my personal opinion that more people have died from the cure than from the disease. So God offers David seven years of famine, three months of being chased by his enemies, or three days of pestilence. And Gad asked David, see what answer I will return to him that sent me. Gad is saying, all right, David, what do you want me to tell God? He's given you three choices. What do you want? Listen. Verse 14, David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. David knew that whatever was going to happen he had a better chance in the hands of God than he did in the hand of men. America, you're about to find out. Verse 15, So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed, and there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba, died, because of a three-day pestilence, seventy thousand men. That's a lot of people, especially back then when the world wasn't eight billion people strong. Seventy thousand Israelites died because David, the leader, sinned. Let me ask you today, how many people do you think in America are about to die because of the sins of the people, the leaders, those in charge? Now, as far as I know, we have about 390 million people in the United States. They may have had two or three million then and 70,000 died. That was more than 10%. Let me ask you, if 10% of Americans died in the judgment hand of God, do you realize that would be 39 million people to suffer the consequences of the sin, sins, plural, of America? You know and I know that what is an abomination in the eyes of God our leaders have made legal, our Supreme Court, our judges, our Congress, our Senate, the White House. They have legalized sin. They have legalized what is 
an abomination in the eyes of God. Not to mention some Christians because they don't want to offend people. Yeah. Do you know the Bible says when Stephen was stoned, that Paul stood there and held the coats of those stoning them. And the apostle Paul admitted, he said, by my silence, I gave my consent. Do you realize way back in the 60s when prayer was snatched out of schools, the churches did nothing. And that one woman succeeded in having prayer taken out of the schools. And back in the 70s, when they wanted to legalize the murder of unborn children, the church did little or nothing, and it was passed. And oh, they did not do away with it. They just gave the authority to the states. Now, if your state wants to murder babies, they can. Do you not realize that God keeps an accurate record of what this country has done, not only to ourselves and its people, but to the other people around the world. The people that we have murdered to satisfy militaries and other nations. The guns that we have sold to their enemies because we wanted to see those governments fail how that our nation has supported leaders that would walk hand in hand with the United States even though they were cruel to their people? I don't have a written list of what all we've done. But if you're silent about it, like Paul, then you've given your consent to it. And America is going to reap. So the Lord sent pestilence and 70,000 men died. Listen, verse 16. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, it's enough. Like David said, at least in the hands of God, he has mercy. Man does not. So God, when he saw the angel about to destroy Jerusalem, he said to the angel, it's enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Aruna the Jebusite. <coughs> I don't know about you, but I have heard from others, watchmen, prophets, myself, that God is going to show America no mercy. You hear what I just said? God is going to show America no mercy. As I heard the Lord say, when his judgment falls, the righteous will die and go to heaven. The wicked will die and go to hell. Do you think because you're a believer that you don't face the things coming on this nation? Do you think because your name is on the Sunday school roll at your church and you give lots of money that you and your family are going to be safe? As I have shared it before and I'll share it again at this point. God got me out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning in a motel in uh, Georgia. My wife and I went down to visit a pastor who's online and be in his church service. And God spoke to me the night before that America was going to be invaded and we are and will be. That cities would burn and they will. And God spoke to me and said, multitudes, multitudes. Multitudes mean numbers you cannot count. Multitudes will die. It's coming. Good, bad, or otherwise. It's coming. David was given three choices. God sent pestilence. 70,000 died. Uh, and then God stayed the hand of the angel that was about to destroy Israel or Jerusalem. In verse 17, 
And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, it's me. I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. Do you remember when the scribes and Pharisees and chief priests of the days of the Lord cried out unto uh, Pilate, talking about crucifying Jesus? They said, let his blood be on us and our children. Mom and dad, do you realize that your children are going to suffer the judgments of America? The only thing you can do is pray and encourage them to accept Jesus Christ before they die. You cannot stop it. If Daniel were here praying, God would not stop it. If Moses was here praying, God would not stop it. Multitudes across this country are about to die. Are you ready? Is your family ready? Listen to what happens here in 2 Samuel 24. In verse 18, And Gad the seer came that day to David and said unto him, Go up. Rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. David didn't want to see the people of Israel suffer for what he did. He didn't want to see more people die. He wanted to stop this thing. So God gave him a solution in that day. And the prophet Gad told him to go and build an altar unto the Lord. And David, according to the saying of God, went up as the Lord commanded, and Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. He saw David coming. He knew who he was. And Aruna said, listen, and Aruna said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? King David, why are you here? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed or stopped from the people. God has sent me, Aruna, to get this threshing floor, to build an altar, to stay the plague. Isn't it amazing that even in the Bible, a pestilence is known as a plague. As I was researching for this, one of the greatest plagues the world has ever seen was back in 1338. They called it the Black Death, the bubonic plague. It hit Europe. If you Well, you don't remember because none of us were here, but history records it that during the period from 1348 to 1350, the Black Death was responsible for at least one-third the population of Europe. A pestilence, a plague in the 1300s took out one-third the population of Europe. Now, you know and I know America is much bigger than Europe. We have 390 million people. If God were to send, and he is, I'll tell you that in a minute. If God sends a pestilence, if God sends a plague on America, if like Europe, we're looking at over 100 million people will die from the plague, the pestilence. I believe this man-made stuff is Toys compared to what God's about to do. And I'll share that with you if you'll hang on. David bowed himself upon the ground. Aruna asked him why did he come and David told him to build an altar to stop the plague of that day. Now listen in verse 22. And Aruna said unto David, Let the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him, 
Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice. He's providing the oxen and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. Take my plows, use them for firewood. Listen, all these things did Aruna as a king Give unto the king, and Aruna said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. In other words, Aruna offered to give his oxen, his threshing floor, the wood for firewood. He wanted to give it to David because David was king. He said, I'll give it to you. But listen in verse 24. I want you to look in a mirror. And listen to verse 24. And the king said unto Aruna, David said unto Aruna, Nay, no, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. I'm telling you today, an offering that costs you nothing is worth nothing. Too many of the people who call themselves the church, they only can give God their leftovers. They only give God what's left. They take out what they want first, and then they give God what's left, if that. But King David, a man after God's own heart, already lost 70,000 men. And here's a man wanting to give him at no charge whatever he needs to build the altar in obedience to God. But David recognizes if he does what Aruna says, he will offer God an offering that cost him nothing. I've said it so many times, and I'm going to say it again at this point. It's not how much you give. It's what did it cost you to give it. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver and to King David, pocket change. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Listen, after he bought it, after he paid for it, after he gave something, after he made a sacrifice, even though it was small to King David, David made a sacrifice to obey the Lord. How many of God's people today are willing to make a sacrifice to please God? Are you? Has God asked you to do something and you don't want to do it? That don't matter. Are you willing to deny yourself, take up your cross, and obey God? I remember when 2019 in February, God spoke to me and Gail about leaving everything behind. We had no idea. Within 30 days, we left everything behind, got in a camper, came to Spencer, Tennessee. I worked as a camp host, no pay. I worked six days a week for free cleaning bathrooms, toilets, cleaning fire pits, carrying firewood to campers. I worked six days a week for six months. When Byron and Susie Cyril said, God wants you in Vermont. We pulled that 40-foot camper over three days and nights to Rutland, Vermont, and moved in with Byron and Susie, and they had to put up with strangers in the house who wanted things different. 
but they tolerated us three months until we could find an apartment. And we lived in Rutland, Vermont for three years. And if you know me and the videos at all, you know that April of 2022, we moved to Lenore City, Tennessee, and we've been here now over two years. We've done what God asked us to do, and it still has cost us. But when David obeyed the Lord, the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. God stopped the plague after. <laughs> God stopped the pestilence the plague after David obeyed. And as I said earlier, this is coming to America. What happened here in the story of 2 Samuel chapter 24, pestilence sent by God, is coming to America. Look at Matthew 24 and 7. I got it right here on my notes. Matthew 24 and 7. God is not going to give us a choice as he did David. Listen, Matthew 24 and 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and you know they are and have been, and kingdom against kingdom, and they are. Listen, this is what's coming. And there shall be famines with an S. Plural, and pestilences with an S, and earthquakes. You ain't seen nothing yet. What's coming to America, the most vile country in the world? America is the most vile nation in the sight of God. It used to be a good place to live. But God's hand is against America. His judgments are falling. Unusual storms, flooding, tornadoes, Upcoming hurricanes, death and destruction to America. God has told me he's going to reduce America to nothing in the sight of the world so that the nations of the world can fear the God of Israel. What God does to his enemies. So let me ask you today. What have you given God that has cost you anything to give it? Don't you go away today saying, Eddie Paul's asking for money. No, I'm not. Have you given anything to your neighbor who's in need? Have you loaned him your lawnmower because his is broke? Have you bought diapers for his baby when he's out of work? Have you carried him to the store when his car wouldn't go? Have you not read where Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself? Have you given to the poor? Are you giving to needy? Now, I'm not talking about, now, hear me. I read online that the president of Goodwill Yet $750,000 a year, and I think that's been increased to a million dollars a year, and I stand to be corrected. 
So why would you donate anything to Goodwill when they're going to line the pockets of the president and CEO of Goodwill? Do you realize that the president of the American Red Cross, I read years ago, got $400,000 a year? Are you helping the poor? Or are you just giving money for a tax deduction? Seventy thousand of Israel died when David realized what he had done. Let me ask you today, how many people in America are going to have to die before you realize you're going to have to put some skin in the game? You heard me. Many of people call themselves Christians are not willing to put their skin in the game. They're not willing to deny themselves, take up the cross and follow me. And I'm going to report, uh, repeat that scripture. Jesus said it. He that is not willing to deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Jesus said it is not worthy of me. No, 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 no. You cannot buy your way into heaven. No, you can't. If you could buy your way into heaven, Steve Jobs would be there. George Soros would make it. Bill Gates would make it. Elon Musk would make it. But you cannot buy your way into heaven. You can't do it. It's only by the grace of God. It's not of works, the Bible says, lest men should boast. You can't work hard enough to earn your way to heaven, but you can deny yourself, take up your cross, and make a sacrifice on, unto the Lord that will cost you something. Just this week, I had the privilege of sitting at the counter at Donna's Diner in Lenore City. Donna's owned that cafe for 14 years. She fixes home-cooked meals, meatloaf, country-style steak, fried chicken, barbecue. She cooks it. You watch her in the ki kitchen cooking while you eat. So every now and again on my way to the post office, I'll stop by there, get something to eat, bring something home for Gail. This week, I sat down at the counter beside a white-haired man my age, and we started talking. So I want to share this with you before I go. He began to share with me how that years ago, when he was actively a preacher, that he visited a church here in Tennessee. He knew the pastor was a man in his 80s and a good preacher, he said. Small country church. And he said that he visited this church and was surprised when the pastor announced that he had a visiting preacher that Sunday and would not be preaching. The pastor introduced a black preacher from Kentucky. And this pastor was telling me at Donna's Diner that this black man was the only black person in the church. And you know and I know God is not a white man. But anyway, the pastor said that he wanted to take an offering before he gave the service to the preacher. And God spoke to the man sitting beside me and told him, write a check for $250 and put it in the offering. And we're talking about years ago. God spoke to this white-haired man and told him to write a check for $250 Put it in the offering. The preacher sitting beside me told me. He said, I was a construction man. I, hold, I had bulldozers. I had plows. I had dump trucks at that time. He said, it had rained off and on for five weeks. I had not been able to work. The rear end of my dump truck had broke down. A track came off one of my bulldozers. He said, I was broke. He said, all I had was $30 in the bank. 
and God spoke to me in church to write a check for 250 and give in the offering. I've had God to ask me to give more than I could afford to give, and I did. This man sitting with me this week in Donna's Diner said, I wrote a check for $250, and I put it in the offering plate when they passed it. They put it in an envelope and gave it to the pastor. For whatever reason, the pastor, when he introduced the preacher, he told the congregation, he said, all the offering goes to this preacher. And I'm going to give it to him right now, lest I forget it at the end of the service. So he handed the envelope to the black preacher and sat down. The black preacher began to cry. He didn't know what was in that envelope. But here's what the black preacher told the church that day. He said, I know a lady who lives in California. Now, here he is in a church in Tennessee. I know a lady in California whose mother is dying here in Tennessee, and she don't have the money to come. Her mother don't have the money. Now, he hadn't opened the envelope yet. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I got us beside myself and prayed before the service and I told God, Lord, I'm asking for $250 to buy a bus ticket to bring that woman from California to Tennessee so she can be with her mother before she dies. He said, folks, I'm trusting God for $250 to so he opened the envelope in front of the church and guess what? There was $257. That small church could only give $7. But in obedience to God, the visiting preacher wrote a check for $250. And he told me sitting at the diner, he said, I thought, well, he's going to be surprised when that check don't clear the bank because I ain't got it. But he obeyed the Lord. And the black preacher preached. He got the offering he asked for. The white-haired preacher told me, he said, the next day I went to the post office as usual to pick up my mail. And there was a letter from a man I had known years earlier. Hadn't heard anything from him, didn't know anything. Just surprised I got a letter in the mail from this man that I had done business with two years ago. He said, I did some work for him and he wouldn't pay me. He said, when I challenged him and told him that he owed me the money for the work that I had done, he said, the man cursed me. So I walked away without my money. The work was done. So to my surprise, two years had gone by when I got a letter. <laughs> I got a letter from that man who cursed me. And when I opened the letter, the very next day, after he had written a check for $250 that he didn't have, the very next day, he got a check in the mail from the man that cursed him for $2,500. <laughs> and the man wrote him a short testimony and said, I did you wrong two years ago. I didn't pay you. I cursed you. But since then, I met Jesus and I got saved. And Jesus said, I need to repent and pay you. Oh, I could take all day and tell you stories how God spoke to us to give $500 from our church to a missionary we didn't have it, but we gave it anyway. And the next day, a businessman came and wrote my church a check for $5,000 because a man that owed him $50,000 paid him and he wanted to give his tithes to my church. I could tell you the story how I asked God for $2,000 we needed 
to pay our rent, make the car payment, and move to Georgia so Gail could go back to college, Franklin Springs, Georgia, so Gail could go to college. We needed $2,000. And the very next day, I was invited to a church who gave me a surprise offering of $2,045 the next day. I'm telling you, you will be blessed if you are willing to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Meaning, obey him. I don't know who you are. I don't know what God's asked you to do. He may tell you to give your neighbor $500. He may tell you to give an organization $500. I don't know. It may be $50. But I'm telling you, Unless your gift is a sacrifice, it means nothing to God if it costs you nothing to give it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I, I really don't know who I'm preaching to today, but I know somebody is hearing from the Lord you are confirming their suspicion. They know they're to give. They know what they're to give, but they don't want to give it. Lord, how little do they know that their gift may open a door for a new job. Their gift may open a door for healing. Their gift, Lord, may open a door for their marriage or their family to be restored. I don't know. I'm just sharing your word that when David repented of his sin and obeyed the Lord, God stopped the plague when David was willing to pay for the threshing floor the oxen, and the wood. Father, I pray today that people will listen to this message and be willing to obey you in whatever you have asked. For I remember Jesus was impressed with the widow's two mites. Lord, they may not have much to give, but you don't require much from those who don't have it. Lord, I know that some could have an income tax coming, income tax refund coming, or settlement from an estate or the sale of a house. They got money coming. And they've already made up their mind how they're going to spend it. Lord, I pray that they will put aside what they want and do what you want. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I go any further, that made me think, and I want to share a short story how God used me 35, 40 years ago. I had an income tax refund coming of $900. I thought of ways to spend it before I got it. Nathan Bendoy, <laughs> Sarah, I had been invited to come to the Philippines and speak at an annual conference there at my expense because they couldn't afford it. And I was making plans to go to the Philippines to speak for 21 days in 1985 in a conference. Oh, how I was going to spend this $900 tax refund. When I went to the post office that day and the refund was in my box, you know those uh, brown envelopes 
that when the federal government sends you a tax refund, they did then, today it's direct deposit. When I pulled that envelope out of the mailbox, my wheels began to spin. I'd already planned how I was going to spend that $900. And I took the envelope over to the table at the post office. I opened it, pulled that check out, and oh, as I did. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord came upon me. And the voice of God spoke in my heart. Send Pastor Bendoy, in the Philippines, $500 to prepare for your coming. You see, I had never been to the Philippines. I had no idea that a day's pay in the Philippines in 1985 was $1.50, was a day's pay. I didn't realize when I arrived there that tipping people a dollar was nearly a day's pay. No wonder they carried my suitcase. I didn't know. But God, in a dream, Sarah Bendoy, the pastor's wife, spoke to me in a dream and said, We can't afford to feed you, Brother Eddie. They eat a bowl of rice three times a day. And if they were lucky, they had some sardines to sprinkle on top in little pieces to give it some meat because fish was plentiful in the islands of the Philippines. When Robert Mendoy got that $500, he made a bed for me to sleep on because him and his family was laying on the floor. He put mosquito net on my window that had no glass so the mosquitoes wouldn't eat my white meat. He laughed at me when I got there. They got sticky paper that people put in their drawers and put sticky paper on the wall in my little closet where I slept made it look like wallpaper. They had painted the floor a burgundy color because there was no rug, no carpet, concrete. We were living in the basement of a wealthy man. He bought some wood and made a small picnic table for me to put in one room of the house so his children wouldn't see how good Eddie Paul eat when I got there. While they sit in the kitchen with a bowl of rice, I had fried chicken at my table because they went and bought a chicken and killed it and fried it and put it at my table. They didn't want their children to see it. Brother Robert told me, he said, I don't want my children to eat like you because when you're gone, they won't eat like that. You see, I would have spent that $500 foolishly to please me, but instead I made a sacrifice out of that tax refund. I sent $500 to the Philippines and Robert was able to take that and prepare for my arrival. And I was able to preach two or three times a day for 21 days. We baptized 125 people in the ocean out behind the church. They killed pigs to feed the conference. The elders of the church bought a pig for $10, two weeks pay, fed it for a year to prepare for this conference so they could kill one pig a day to feed the people a pork stir fry. Today, Robert is old, older than me, ha ha, and still working, still pastoring a church, still baptizing people. His wife, Sarah, is 
pastoring another church in the same area. His son, Nathan, who was a little boy, is now 49 years old, 48, 49 years old, with three kids in college, pastors another church. Seed we planted in 1985 <laughs> is still producing fruit. All God asked of me was $500 and to travel 8,000 miles to a place I had never been. And the ministry is still winning souls. <laughs> what sacrifice! What sacrifice are you willing to make for a soul? We don't have much time left. Are you willing to deny yourself? Take up your cross and give something that costs you something to give it. Thank you again to the 136 people who shared last week's video. Thank you. I thank you for your cards and letters. I thank you for your gifts that enable us to help the people of Pakistan, the Philippines, the street preacher, the homeless ministry, the food camps, the work that we're doing, thank you. Gail is sitting 12 feet over there in her recliner listening to me. And Joshua is my witness. She don't want to get out of her recliner anymore. It hurts so much, so bad. She goes all night without a bathroom break because she don't want to get up anymore. And sometimes throughout the day. This week, I ordered a hospital bed to be delivered from, to my house from the manufacturer. It was only $1,700, and I know to some of you that's a lot of money, but I'll pay what it costs to take care of Gail. I've ordered a hospital bed, and when it arrives, it's one like they use in ICU units. When it gets here, Joshua will probably help put it together, roll it into the living room, take the electric lift chair recliner out. And unless God answers our prayers, Gail's going to be confined to a hospital bed day and night because she can't walk anymore. It hurts too much. You best be careful when you tell God you're willing to do anything. <clears throat> Joshua, am I telling the truth? Yeah. Do we hear your mama cry and moan and groan when she tries to stand up to change her clothes? Yeah. And now we almost have to do a small load of laundry for Gail every day. And for some reason, you always talk about the Lord buying you a Mercedes Benz. Well, when Gail's in the chair and she's hurting, she'll say, Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. And that reminds me of 
Janis Joplin song, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Is what he's talking about. But I'm not asking God for a Mercedes Benz. I'm asking God to help us win souls. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? Three times, Peter said yes. And three times, Jesus said, feed my sheep. Every video we make is an attempt to feed his sheep. I hope you got something out of this video today. And if you did, share it. For the Bible says, when the gospel is preached into all the world, then the end comes. Eddie Paul, Gail, we're ready for the end. Until next week, God bless.